Good morning, everyone. Uh, while you're coming in, I'm going to make a few announcements from your bulletin. If you'll look at them, let me highlight some. Let's just start with the tear-off sheet. Uh, we're using the tear-off sheet again after a long time off because of COVID. And if, if you look at that, you're going to see I'm interested in being baptized. If you have not been baptized, how about marking that? And you, you and I will have a little talk about baptism and try to understand where you're at and what the scripture says and, and see if that's something for you. Um, we, you can clean toys in the kids area. We've got a kids ministry going on and there's lots of things to do over there. And it's just one, if that's something that appeals to you and you could help in that way, that'd be great. Or coffee time. We started coffee time again recently after COVID. We lost some volunteers during that process. And so if that's something you could do, it's not hard. That would be a fantastic gift. Um, if you are not, you say, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. Hey, let's talk. I would love to talk with you. Mark that, I'll give you a call. We'll sit down together and have a talk about it. In your bulletin, some other things. Change Your World monies are collected. Now, Change Your World is something that we do, but we don't want people to feel like they have to do. So some of us save our change and we use it for good causes. And this month it's for Bibles for the troops. So there's a deposit place out there. You can put your change if you have that. We've been having terrible phone issues. So I would guess the phone works maybe five minutes out of every hour for the last few weeks. We bought a cell phone for, for temporary use and you'll find that number in your bulletin. If you need to contact us this week, do that. But I believe on Thursday we're going to get all of this worked out. But just so you know, um, <clears throat> the youth ministry, we have 15 people who are on their way to Tijuana right now. And we want to pray for them this week. <clears throat> Excuse me. We want to pray for them. So remember them during the week. And then on August 15th, they're going to give us a report about what God has done in their lives and through their lives on this trip. Uh, read about the Beginnings Care for Life Walk and Run, which is coming up fast. We have a birthday party today for an old man. Glenn Snap's turning 50 years old. And so uh, right out here in the lobby, some after the service birthday party for Glenn. If you can join him at that party, fantastic. Uh, we're going to have a car show coming up on August 14th out here and I'm expecting hundreds of cars to be here. And you know, you, maybe you're not a car person, uh, and maybe you are, but you, you might not know a GTO from a, from a Chevelle, okay? But I hope you'll come anyways, and here's why. We're gonna have lots of people come to this car show. And it's a fundraiser. The fundraiser is nobody has to pay to come, but if they buy a lunch, they can either pay what the lunch costs or they can give a donation as well. That's gonna help with the adult Mexico team in October. But here's how you can help. As you see people here and strike up conversations with them, especially friends, you can say, this is my church. Where do you go to church? And if they don't have a church home, Invite them to become part of our church family. Invite them to come. Tell me, I'll sit with you tomorrow. And have them come. And we can use this as a, a, an opportunity as well. Uh, our friends Alvaro and Raquel Garriga are going to be here um, for in the month of August. They are missionaries to Central Asia. They need a vehicle. If that's something you could supply them for that time, that would be fantastic. Now. Uh, Alvaro, I used to play basketball with Alvaro a long time ago. He's like six foot seven, so not a subcompact vehicle, but something a little bigger than that. But if you can do that, that would be fantastic. And you can read about that in your bulletin. Uh, read about the couples getaway too. If you're thinking about going in September, need to move fast on that. Talk to Hal about that. And you can read the rest of the announcements in the bulletin. We want to worship. So let's turn our hearts to the Lord. Let's worship him together. Before we do that, there are register pads on that side of a row. If you would find one of those and pass it this way and then back to where it came from, we'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Our call to worship is a responsive reading, so if you would please follow along. Now, first service, I just want you to know 
that that when we got to the part where it says blessed be the name of the Lord as we started it was blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be the name of the Lord so let's let's bless him the name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run to it and are safe blessed be the name of the Lord O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song for him whose name is the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord is the God of hosts. The Lord is his name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's stand together and sing, Blessed be the name of the Lord. your name because you've blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Because of your goodness, because of your glory, because of your wonderful, wonderful cross, we can be blessed. We thank you for your great grace. We thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We ask you, Lord, to enter our lives, to guide us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. To help us to understand you, to understand each other, and to love more and more and more. Make us like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You can be seated.
God, maker of heaven and earth and of us. We have some of your children here who need your help now and they need to know that they have your help. I pray that you will bless them, that you will make your face to shine upon them, that you'll meet them in their need and lift them up, grant them endurance and patience and even joy in the midst of their trial and we'll give thanks to you for what you'll do would you put on our hearts and minds ways that we can help them and love them with your love and what we pray for our church family lord we pray for your other children who are gathered around this area today would you bless them would you make your face to shine upon them? And would you speak to them? Lord, we need to hear your word, and I pray you'll speak to us this morning. Don't let my words get in the way, please, but speak to our hearts what we need to hear 
so that we can bring honor and glory to you through Jesus. Amen. We're in a series on the Samuel books, and we're thinking this week and next week about spiritual formation issues. So what was it that formed David into a leader, a successful military man, and and most importantly, the servant of God through whom the king of the world would come? What, what were the events that shaped him? What attitude sustained him? Was he extraordinarily brave? Was he exceptionally intelligent? Was he spiritually sensitive? What was it that made David the great man that he was? What formed him? What was it that deformed Saul into a man who could turn on his own children? who couldn't keep the truth in mind, even after he clearly perceived it, who came to care about nothing but his own power and position. What attitudes deflated him? Was he spiritually dull? How did he become the failure that he ended up being? Uh, Last week when we looked at chapter 16 and 17, I mentioned to you that the author was putting us on notice in the story of David and Goliath that this is really more about David versus Saul than David versus Goliath. That really became clear then in chapter 18 and remains the governing storyline through the rest of this book. As in the story of David and Goliath, David is again facing a bully who seems to have everything going for him. Saul has all the power. But like Goliath, he doesn't have the Lord. And so the outcome is already assured. The question that would have troubled the book's first readers, probably not the question that bothers us, they would have wondered, how can there be two anointed kings in Israel at the same time? Remember that Samuel, at the request, I should say at the demand of Israel's leaders, and under the direction of God, had anointed Saul to be king. It wasn't that God had chosen Saul, but rather God acquiesced to Israel's demand. Now, there is a fundamental theological truth that underlies this book and all of the historical books and helps us understand why Saul failed when David succeeded. That truth is stated explicitly in an important passage in chapter 8. It's this, the Lord is Israel's king. Believing that, David saw himself as a vassal king, responsible to the Lord. Not believing that, Saul saw himself as the king of the hill, responsible only to himself. Because Saul would not submit to the Lord, God instructed Samuel to anoint another king, even though it would be years before he was ready to be crowned. So now we have the problem of two anointed kings. How would it be resolved? That question is answered slowly, painfully, and sometimes embarrassingly in 1 Samuel 18 through 31. Today we look at how David was formed. Next week we'll see how Saul was deformed. Our objective is to discover how we can cooperate with the formation process and become people who, like David, know and obey God. Next week, we'll learn how to avoid being deformed into people who, like Saul, merely pay God lip service while doing their own thing. How was David formed? For he certainly underwent a process of spiritual formation, just like we do. His story doesn't begin with the victory over Goliath. That victory was the product, the result of a process of spiritual, mental, and emotional formation that had been going on for a long time. That's important to keep in mind because we too are undergoing a process of formation, even right now. We can't skip the process and still get the product. We want to start off with the victory, but that's not how it works. God had been preparing David for his role before David even knew he had a role. 
his genetics, his heritage, and his early experiences were part of that preparation. Now there's not much that can be done about genetics and heritage, nor is there much that needs to be done, thankfully. But experience is another matter. Think of David's experience. He was the youngest of seven sons. And by the way, in another place, in a later book, we read that David was one of eight sons. And people have brought that up as a, a discrepancy in the scriptures. My own thinking is that David's father had eight sons, but that one of them died, probably long before David was even born. He was the youngest of seven, and you know what that means. He learned to get along with his older brothers, who frankly were sometimes arrogant. There's an example of that in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. God used those difficult relationships without David even knowing it to form him into a person who knew how to deal with difficult people. And by the way, in 1 Samuel, we read that the people who gathered around David were difficult people. Interestingly, his brothers were eventually among those people who gathered around David and recognized him as their leader. David's first job was as a shepherd. God used that in his life. God used your first job in your life as well. David was outdoors. Because he's a shepherd, he was outdoors day and night for stretches of time. And because of that, he learned the terrain. He learned where and at what times of the year he could find watering holes. He knew the best places to cross the mountains and where to find caves that offered shelter. That knowledge proved invaluable to him when he needed to hide himself in hundreds of other people from Saul's search parties. Because David was a shepherd, he spent a lot of time alone. Early on, he began talking to God. He wrote songs to God. Psalm 23 is one of those songs, the Lord is my shepherd. He had an instrument, and he became proficient at it, which, and who would have guessed this, was what first provided him access into the royal palace. Those times alone were instrumental in forming David's character and providing him with a unique skill set that he would later use. God used the knowledge David gained from his early years of the terrain of passes through the mountains and watering holes, the knowledge of dealing with difficult people, even his knowledge of how to play a musical instrument, God used all of that for his purpose. And that purpose included God's larger objective of bringing Christ into the world. God's use of David's past was no aberration. He makes use of our past too. I, for example, developed a love for books early on when I was still a kid, which is interesting because neither of my parents read very much. My dad had the newspaper in the mornings, and that was about it. But I learned to love books. In fact, when I was in elementary school, I would walk more than a mile in our city to get to the library so on Saturdays, and I'd spend an hour or two in the library every Saturday. And I learned to write better than maybe some people did. I wrote my first book, and my only book, when I was in elementary school. It was an expose on my arch enemy, my grade school companion, David Pilak, and I even acquired a talented artist to illustrate it for me, my third grade neighbor and best friend, Ronnie Lowe. Somebody asked me today, you still have that book? <laughs> no, I don't, know. I don't know what happened to that book. But. So fast forward a long way. About 20 years ago, I read a, a column in the newspaper, a religion column, and I just shook my head and thought, this is not very good. Oh. And I said to God at that time, Lord, if you ever want me to write a column, I think I would like to do that. Two weeks later, our newspaper called me out of the blue. I had not spoken to anyone of this, even my wife Karen, only God. And they asked me, would you be interested in writing a column? And of course I said, yeah, I think I would be interested in that. And that column now appears in newspapers around the country pointing people to Jesus, our past, prepares us for our present role. Even past tragedy can be used to bring present good. 
I've seen people, I'm thinking of one in particular right now, who have suffered almost unthinkable abuse and yet have sanctified their past and used their experience to help people in the present. People whose sins have landed them in prison have become the instrument through which God has given hope to the hopeless. God uses our past, even our past sins, once repented for his purpose. Now, David's youthful past was not the only thing God used. He also used his painful present, and it was painful. The father of his future bride was thinking of ways to kill David even before he married his daughter. Now, I suspect that some of you dads might resonate with that, but hopefully you've never acted on the thought. It's all did. Ever have a boss that, that didn't like you? I worked at the Ford plant, and I was sure that my foreman hated my guts, that he couldn't stand me. David had a boss who try, twice tried to pin him to the wall with a spear. You talk about a bad boss? For some reason, and things were complicated, David went back to work for Saul after that. And in fact, the mercurial Saul even gave him a promotion partly so that he could transfer him and get him out of the way. But God was with David, and wherever he went and whatever he did, he succeeded. That success benefited King Saul immensely, but he wasn't glad of it. In fact, it galled him. He felt threatened by David. He obsessed over him. 1 Samuel 18.12 tells us what was really going on. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had left Saul. Now don't miss that. The difference between a confident and grateful Saul and the Saul that we see fearful and hostile was the difference between the presence and the absence of the Lord in his life. This is so important to the story that the author of 1 Samuel repeats that line three times. Now, pause there for a moment. Saul was king. Saul had a palace. Saul had an army. Saul had wealth, servants, soldiers, comforts. Contrast that to David. After chapter 19, he never again goes to the palace. He doesn't even get to go home again. He lives on the run as a hunted man. His life is balanced on the edge of a knife. One mistake and Saul will kill him, and not only him, but all of the people with him. So here we have Saul, who is wealthy and powerful and lives in luxury, while David is poor in constant danger and lives in caves. And yet the Lord is with David, not with Saul. Tell that to the prosperity gospelers. We tend to think that if we had money and possessions, life would be good. But the real difference between a life that is good and a life that is bad is the presence of the Lord in that life. David was a fugitive for years. He couldn't stay in one place for any length of time. So he was always on the run. Saul's people were constantly on the lookout for him. Whenever they got a tip on David's location, soldiers were dispatched to kill him. That's when David's experience as a shepherd proved invaluable. He knew the terrain like no one else. He knew where he could hide large groups of people, where he could find water and food. He knew the most defensible locations. And by the way, one of the people who caused David most trouble and who worked for Saul was another shepherd, a guy named Doeg. He knew the same things David knew. David knew where to go, he knew where to hide, but can you imagine doing that for over 10 years? Saul's troops gave chase. I put that map up there so you get an idea. At least 17 times over the course of those 10 years. David was finally forced to leave the country entirely. 
people who sided him with him were killed. The wives and children of his soldiers were taken captive. The pressure on David was phenomenal. His life was a forge, and his circumstances the fire in which he was being shaped into God's person. During this time, David cried out to God again and again. This is one of the songs he wrote to God. This is Psalm 6. My soul is in anguish. How long, O Lord, how long? I'm worn out from groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping. Here's another, Psalm 13. How long, O Lord? That's a refrain in many of his songs. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Pain, whether it's physical or emotional, has a way of swallowing us up. It demands our attention. It becomes all that we can think about. Many of us have experienced significant pain. Eye troubles, back problems, cancer, diabetes. The trouble goes on for days and weeks. Sometimes it goes on for years. David's pain, both physical and emotional, lasted more than a decade. Pain can drive people to God or drive them away from him. What makes the difference? Why did Saul's pain drive him away from God while David's pain drove him to God? Why did hardship temper David but break Saul? Why did David learn to obey even when it hurts? Which was a lesson Saul never mastered. Kevin, our youth pastor and my go-to Old Testament scholar, he thinks that 1 Samuel 15, 22 is the key verse in the entire book. So verse 22 says this, 1 Samuel 15, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. That speech, which occurs at the book's halfway point, is a watershed moment. Why did Saul not obey God when trouble came? I think the answer is he didn't obey, couldn't obey, because he did not trust God. When David got in trouble, which happened over and over again, he made an intentional choice to trust God and was therefore able to obey him. Several times, and speak about intentional, this is very intentional on the part of the author of 1 Samuel. The author shows David obeying God when disobeying seemed more practicable. Advisors were rationalizing disobedience and even recommending it to David, but he obeyed anyways. Now here's the lesson for us to learn. The process of formation always includes stresses and difficulties, pain and conundrums, we will sometimes find in the words of St. Paul that this body of ours has no rest, but we're harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. The pain or danger or uncertainty will scream for our attention. And it is in those moments that we need to turn to God, choose to trust him, and declare our trust to him. I got the opportunity to practice that this week. I was suddenly facing a trial I hadn't expected, and I was immediately worrying about it. It felt like, oh, this is one thing too many. But after that immediate, oh, no, reaction, I realized this was the time to trust the Lord and declare my trust to him. Doing that changed my attitude almost immediately. Now, so far it hasn't changed the situation, but I can approach that situation differently and with confidence now. See, David didn't learn to trust and obey God in spite of hardships and worries and sorrows, but through them. He learned to obey from what he suffered. And guess what? That's how we learn to obey too. It's even how David's greater son, our Lord Jesus, learned obedience. The author of Hebrews says of him, he learned obedience from what he suffered. 
And now listen to how he continues. He learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect, became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Obedience is learned in the school of suffering, but only by those who have faith. They're the only ones who master that lesson. We see that clearly and painfully portrayed in the lives of David and Saul. Faith and obedience are one of those pairs which God has joined together and we must not put asunder. Works done in obedience to God are indivisible from faith, which is why St. Paul made it his goal to bring people to the obedience of faith, or as one version translates, the obedience that is faith. Paul, by the way, bookends, and this is an important literary technique in the Bible. Paul bookends the entire book of Romans with that phrase. Chapter 1, verse 5, chapter 16, verse 26. The obedience of faith. But when things get tough, we will not obey, will not be able to obey unless we trust God. The trouble David endured, physical, emotional, spiritual, was the forge that shaped him into a man of faith. He learned to say, this is Psalm 56, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. We need to learn that too. When Jennifer Rothschild, the singer-songwriter, was a little girl, she was fascinated by color. When she got a box of crayons, the first thing she did was pull every crayon out and read its color. She would study the difference between garnet and scarlet and maroon and burgundy. And her ambition, her dream as a child was to become an artist. Early on, she would be in her dad's office and she would be drawing really good caricatures. She just had the gift and the desire. When she was 12, she started experiencing some challenges. She was bumping into people in the hallway at school. She had trouble working the combination on her lock. She felt like the clumsiest, most ridiculous kid at school. She was embarrassed almost all the time. It never occurred to her that her classmates could see things more clearly than she could. Her parents eventually took her to an optometrist. He sent her to a specialist who diagnosed retinitis pigmentosa and then shocked Jennifer and his parents, her parents by his prognosis. She would soon go entirely blind. She and her parents sat there stunned. All the way home, they were quiet in the car. Her mind was racing. I'm not going to ever be able to drive a car. I'm not going to be an artist. That hurt. Are boys going to want to date me? How am I going to finish high school? Will I be able to go to college? When they got home, still in silence, they went into the house and Jennifer walked straight to the old upright piano in the living room and sat down and began to play. It broke the silence that had held ever since the, the doctor's office. Jennifer knew how to sight read, but by now she couldn't make out the notes, uh, sheet of music. And so for the first time in her life, she played by ear. This is the song that she played. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. I am awed by that teenage girl's faith. 
she did what David had learned to do and what we must learn as well. Choose to trust when we're afraid. Trust in the darkest moments. The heat of the forge will form us into people characterized by the obedience of faith or will deform us into people who try to use God and then disregard him when he doesn't do what we want. And the question is, which kind of people will we be? Will we trust God? Will we say with David, what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. The one who gave his only begotten son for us can be trusted. Let's be those people. Now let's pray. Lord, you can be trusted. But we aren't through the formation process yet. We're half-baked. And how we need your grace. Lord, establish our hearts. Make us firm and steadfast in trusting you. Certainly for our good, for our eternal good, but also for your great glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In first service, I called an audible, and we sang a song at the end. This time, I'm not going to call the audible because our pianist already knows, but I'm going to ask you to stand up and join me, and we're going to sing the first verse of that hymn. and then we'll be dismissed. There are go deep sheets on the cafe tables in the back of the room here. So the go deep sheet just helps you look through the text we've looked at and go deeper into it and apply it to your, your life. I encourage you to pick up one of those. If we run out of those, you can always find those online at the LockwoodChurch.org site. And come on Wednesday night if you can. There's a bunch of us that meet on Wednesday nights and we think through those questions and how they apply to us over in room 303 on the north side of the west building. The offering plates are back there. If you have an offering, you place it in there. Just make it an act of worship. Just worship God as you do that. And then um, we will have prayer helpers who will be right over here on this side of the room. If you have a prayer need in your life, come on up, and they will be happy to pray with you. This may be one of those times where you can say, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. All right, let's pray together. God, send us out to do good things in your name, to recognize the works that you have prepared for us to walk in. We'll need courage for that. I pray that you will help us by your spirit and that you will help us through each other. And may you receive great glory in the name of the one that we love, your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.